Okay, now we're going to go to old business, facilities, rental. No action at this time. I uh, actually met with Joel and Tim today and reviewed some of additional changes, and we have a facilities council advisory with the superintendent and uh, some of my staff next Tuesday, where we'll be discussing this at length. Okay, and then uh, policy? So we have three bringing, that are going forward tonight. Um, the first one that we'll draw your attention to is the uh, the policy six colon three ten, and this is dealing with the alternative credits. And as we discussed before, um, I wanted to, to bring this forward to you as we continue to look at putting class minimums and maximums on uh, policies or on our class sizes, we have to be prepared for some students to be able to take courses that maybe aren't offered. Uh, so that's what uh, 6 colon 310 is, and the changes are tracked accordingly. And that should be part of, I think, the walk-in because we had to make one or two adjustments. Is that correct, Marianne? Yeah. It's towards the back of the walk-in, just because there was some lettering that was off. There was one sentence that was stricken by accident, right, Kevin? That I thought was on 890, wasn't it? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, right. um, when we get to 6 colon 310, the discussion with that, I um, just want to find it here. We had a couple things that we had to correct. Um, Education. Yeah, I'm looking at it right now. The, there was a lot of discussion from the board on the PE waivers. <laughs> so the one thing I want to bring to your attention is um, Ms. Bilesma and I looked at this and there was one area that was uh, that we needed to correct that was mis uh, we misaddressed in the last public meeting. Currently, students who take marching band, even though marching band only marches in as, as a class during the fall, they were able to waive out a PE both fall and the spring. And after further discussion and then looking at the state code, um, this does provide them an advantage over other students because they technically can waive out of two years of physical education to where the varsity athlete or somebody of that nature can't and can't pick up an additional course. Um, so as we wrote this policy, we corrected that so that uh, the students would only be able to waive out of the fall semester. But I want to make clear, and, and, and I'll allow uh, if there's still some additional questions or if I miss something that Pam can then a, a, a jump on top of that, is uh, we also want to make clear that this should not be, should not take effect until uh, the course registration of the incoming freshmen pick their courses in the fall. Because our current freshmen that are going to be sophomores next year are already going to be into the second year of their four-year plan. And anybody besides that that are going to be juniors or seniors are already into their four-year plan and have been counting on this past practice. So we have to take that into consideration a little bit or at least encourage the board to have discussion on that tonight. Oh, um, I, that's not the way I understood it. I thought we were going to, thought our discussion was we would suspend the rule that the band only gets a waiver in the first semester for next year only, not for four years for freshmen. <clears throat> no, 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 no. Next year's freshmen that are already coming in. No, but I'm, I'm saying that there's one more. Next year's the last year for marching band members. <coughs> right, but it, it'd be tough to change the game on a, a junior that's going to pick their class his senior year that now is on a course of study to get into a specific institution or a specific major. Yeah, the it, board changed that policy. It's a question of fairness. Varsity, varsity, if you're, let's pick two sports, uh, tr cross country and track. Let's say it's a distant. I think they get as much exercise as anybody. The day after cross country, they have to go to gym, which means they have to have gym in their schedule. The day up until the day track starts, they have to go to gym, which means they have to have gym in their schedule. You know, it, it's unfair to those students who are also high achieving or whatever, that they have to put gym in their schedule junior and senior year, whatever years they are. But band members who don't have to t even put gym in their schedule, even during the 
fall when they're done the same day the football players are done, that because of that they could keep continuing to have the extra period two semesters and maybe for up to three years. Well, I think I think it's a question of fairness for everybody. And I think if you want to build on the question of fairness is if I have a student who is a sophomore or even a junior uh, right now that has planned out his schedule and wants to go to a certain institution and needs to get those classes in and is <coughs> figuring out because he is a part of marching band that this opens up another period for me to be able to go and get those classes and allow me to go with it. Uh, I think that by initiating with the this year's the, the next year's incoming freshman, you avoid anybody you know planning and, and trying to uh, trying to uh, uh, they realize what the rules are. We're changing the rules with our sophomores, juniors uh, right now uh, and freshmen right now that. Uh, they counted on or that's what they were doing with it. So well, we, did, I, we did I that was, for the Excuse athletes. me, can I finish up here for a minute? So then uh, by, by us not doing that, we're putting undue uh, duress on people who were playing by the rules we set before. And that's usually with something as major as this, like you usually would start out with the freshmen, uh, incoming freshmen, that they would know that rule would happen. So. But well, we didn't do that before. But, so, we used to give waivers for people without even athletics if they had a tough schedule, and we changed that. Right then, didn't do it anymore. So I don't understand why for that group mm -hmm. it was fair to do it right then, but for the band, we have to make this accommodation for several years. That are all, you know, they're advantaged already under the program of being get, having a waiver for the whole semester each year. Um. What my um, discovery was is that historically, I think when originally this group was given the full year out, I was told that the band was involved in competitions at the time, okay. and that when they stopped competing, probably that, that second semester they wouldn't, weren't put back in. So, you know, I think that that's something that over time as it evolved, it might not have been readjusted back, um, because competitive marching band season can go quite a ways into the year depending on how far you're going because they're in, in, in inside venues um, but sophomore as the as the policy is is written and what we do in the freshman year you don't get the exemption uh, for the full year it's just the first semester for the sophomore year you're in health the other part of the year so it would just be you get the advantage of one extra semester class your junior year and one extra semester class your senior year and so some students has, have plotted for that, understanding that those were the rules of the game as, as they were structured. So the, the way um, you know, Dr. Skinkis and I had talked about this was letting the students know in advance so that they could be prepared. Um, because if we did this next year, and the sophomores who then would be registering for their junior year, they would have already maybe made different choices in their freshman and sophomore years, done things during summer, you know, taking something in summer school that they didn't avail themselves of, like health or something, to have an extra semester open to do something. They lost that opportunity, and we can't give them that opportunity back. So that's why we were thinking that it's fair for them to have the, uh, students have the advantage because we do try and have them plot out that four-year plan to do it, you know, to ease it in the freshman year. That was our concern. I think one thing to, to Russell, we, we talked at length about this uh, today because at, she was preparing the building administration and the counselors for that change. Um, Pam and I don't disagree that the advantage is given. So we recognize that the change needs to be made and we need to address how the statute is written. Um, well, I just would urge you in your discussions tonight before we vote to think about that a little bit because there are, it will impact and it will have a, a ripple impact of if a kid now realizes that they can only get that waiver there and they wanted to take four years of a foreign language and four years of a math, um, that they might now drop out of band. So uh, what I want to make sure is as we implement this change, it's at a gradual pace so that it doesn't wipe out our band program either. So I just want you to take that into consideration that as we talk through that a little bit more today, uh, that was brought to my attention that if, if, if it's implemented, 
uh, you know, we would allow the kids that signed up for their PE waivers, obviously, this year and not implement this till course registration in the fall. But if we, if we started to impact those current juniors and seniors that are already in the second and going into the second and third year, their four-year plans, that they could jeopardize their plans of where they had intended on going to college and some of those things. And that being said, I wasn't here in the past, and I understand that there was some changes, I guess, made immediately last year. Mm -hmm. so, so, so I want to clearly understand this. We're giving a waiver next year. So the juniors going into senior are still going to not go to PE the second semester. They would get the current situation. So soft, current year sophomores going into would junior. only lose one class. Current year sophomores going into junior would we're lose one class because next year's a waiver and it's a senior year they would have to. They don't even get a waiver uh, their sophomore year. So they lose that junior year. Well, wait, let's no, 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 no. I thought next year we're not going to implement this, and it's going to be the following year. Right. So, when, so next so year, now next sophomore year sophomores, sophomores are going to pick their junior year as classes. So that they still get the waiver. Cur they get the waiver where so they So the, the, when they go into seniors, when the first year, it's going to impact them. No, they would, impact they would be grandfathered in. No, 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 no. If we implemented this, what Mr. Walsh understood to be, is next year we... Are not going to next year if if we, if we went the way that Mr. One, Walsh was yeah. saying, next year in October, whenever anybody was picking a class, the most they could waive is one semester of PE for marching band. So would so again sophomores going into junior year next year they'd have the waiver. They'd be already through it in their second year of their four year plan, oh. and then you would throw a hitch like in the middle of the game, like changing the graduation requirements almost. That's why. When I, we talked even about graduation requirements, people phase that in, um, usually with an incoming freshman class, so that when they're planning their four-year plan, it's, it's communicated up front. Don't plan on having to, you know, picking up this extra credit and some of the. That's what originally brought this to our attention is that the way that they've been implementing it here for several years was giving an advantage to students that were in the band it because it gives they were waiving two years. It, and Pam, if Tim, my son's a freshman, mm -hmm. if he took out <coughs> this summer. He couldn't wave out of gym. He's not a varsity athlete in the spring, but let's, he is in the fall. But in the fall, he has to go into swim. That right after swimming in the spring, even if he was a varsity athlete, he has to take gym. <coughs> right. So the other thing that's a little bit of a disadvantage to other people too is the, the kids in the band are being allowed to do that and take higher level courses that also increased their grade point average against the kids who are varsity athletes mm -hmm. who can't do that and have to take gym that doesn't, I guess at some level, maybe when you're a senior, there's you're honors correct. or something, right? You're, you are you're absolutely correct. correct. You are correct, mm -hmm. yeah. That has been a, an, an issue, a fairness issue that people, have, some people want addressed. Yeah. Any other uh, comments? Are we, are we discussing this now to yeah. vote on it? Well, this well, would be a second read. read. Yeah. So we're, we're not voting on it. Okay, we're not so voting on it. Well, yeah, we are. We were planning. Oh, yeah. It's planned that it's being asked to be voted on unless we feel that there needs to be more discussion, but this is a second reason. So, so if we, and, and I guess I still don't understand what, if we gave a year waiver next year and then implemented it the following year. We have, so we have students. So that sophomores would have only chance. one class impact because they would still be able to implement the waiver next year. It'd be their senior year where they would not be able to take advantages of the spring semester. No, it would be impacting two years worth of it. If we did no. it the way Mr. Walsh was saying, as a sophomore, they only get the fall semester off anyways, which we're gonna keep that. But when they pick their courses in October, we would wanna say your junior and senior year, you no longer have that advantage. So you'd be throwing a hiccup. In this would be a freshman, year. wouldn't it? Who's going against sophomore next year? You have waiver. He'd have two classes. The sophomores this year would be juniors next year. They would have, they would have the waiver next year and be the senior. Year. The right. seniors would, st the juniors would still get it next year. So it'd be the freshman getting two the classes. Coming impact. in right now, right? No, the freshman this year would the get freshman, two year. The impact. freshman right now today that are sitting in freshman eligible. They're right going to be now, sophomore they're be next sophomores year. next year. So they'll already be in their second year of their fourth. And if we playing. waiver it next year. It's already been wavered. That was happened in October when they picked their courses. So that's already been wavered. So what we're saying is in October, now that, that they're already two, they're going to be in the middle they of would their have second two year. year they'd have two year. We'd be throwing right. a hiccup. Sophomores halfway. would have a one year impact. Juniors would have zero impact. All right. 
think we're saying the same thing, but I think it's sophomores we have a two-year impact. Because if you implemented it in October. Uh, and would next year giving them not enforcing it? When you say sophomore, you're saying as of next fall they're a sophomore? No, I'm saying you're sophomores saying this year are going to be juniors next year. Right, so they get the year. So technically they would. It would so they would have. One year of a full One year, year impact. One course impact. Freshman would have two. The freshman this year, who be sophomore next year, would have two. Right. I think what we were saying is a st current student would go under the old policy until they finished and graduated. They're grandfathered in. So because they had already counted on it and they had made decisions and planned accordingly, that's the way it's presented here. So that you, you would just start using this policy with the new freshmen because you would explain it to them up front. They'd work with their counselors on it from the beginning. They would know and not, no, nothing's changing mid-course on them. Does that make sense? So well, I understand yeah. what you're saying. Yeah. I'm just saying the impact on current year sophomores, juniors, and freshmen if we did a one-year waiver and implemented it. So yeah. current year juniors, you would have no impact. Right. Zero impact. Current year sophomores, you'd have a one year impact. One class impact. Mm -hmm. But an impact. Right. 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 An impact mm -hmm. here. Yeah, I think. And then freshmen, you would have a two year. Right. Two year impact. Mm -hmm. And that two years would be in our junior senior year. Yeah. Correct. Mm -hmm. Well, it depends with. Uh, no, I guess if we waived it completely next year, it would work for freshmen, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. But I think we should go. I don't see this as changing the graduation requirements as much as correcting something that we probably should not have been doing. And I think my bias would be that we would implement the plan for the school year 13-14. So they've already registered for the 12-13 year. And then we start with the 13-14. I don't think that this is something we need to protect this time. We shouldn't have been doing this all along. You know, it's, I think it's enough that we're giving a year for people to adjust. Well, let me ask Governor Pam a different question. Mm -hmm. Don't you think it's important that the students get gym and get exercise? Absolutely. I mean, to me, that's, mm -hmm. to me, the biggest problem with yeah. it, the, the grade point average thing is a minor thing. It's just a little right. unfairness. But, you know, with the, all you read every day is kids need an exercise and obesity be a problem. And, yeah. To me, that's the main reason not to do it, that I'd rather see him get exercise than take another music class. I'm just, you know, I don't think, I, I got nothing against music classes. Right. That's fine, or, or whatever the type of classes they're going to take. I think that's the spirit of the code. Okay. We, don't, we don't disagree. Do we don't okay. disagree. It's, what, we're, what we're anticipating, though, is, is, is changing something mid-stride for those parents that are going to be going into their junior or senior year and have been thinking, hey, I can get this many AP courses or you know, this many years of math in a foreign language and be a four-year music student. Mm -hmm. But it's built in here that even if we did change it for the 13-14 year, there is a caveat that if a parent came to you and requested a special waiver to complete a course, you as superintendent or principal have the right yeah. to per to honor that. Yeah, Where's the exceptions? Where is you that? have the right to make those exceptions. Uh, there were several places yeah. in, in the beginning uh, where there. Ex that was I think just in a number of enrichment credits. No, but I think believing in Jim also that if they uh, is the gym right here uh, required for graduation from high school, and then number two required for admission to a specific institution, higher learning, a student must be 11th or 12th grade. And that's that's who would be impacted. That's who you're saying that would be impacted. That's for correspondence courses. No, that was enrichment course. Yeah, it's it's per course up there, Laura. But yeah, I Laura. think for the same thing. So I would take that to read for somebody who's going into going to be a music major or going to a university for music and needs that that full year or, or whatever. If the institution states that they need that. Um, because we added the word specific, that was Dr. Keene's suggestion <coughs> last time. So, to on number, th you're looking at item number three on the last page of the policy. Well, you have many, but you have substitutions for physical education and other required courses. There, there's a whole section there. Mm -hmm. That's one area. You're talking at the bottom or at the top of the page? Is this kind of a uh, 
it was on page 67 and so on. under world language courses then you have yeah. another one it's substitution for time. physical education and Especially other required courses can I just ask which piece of paper are we all looking at are we looking at the walk-in the walk, -in? The walk, -in. Yes. The walk -in. okay so we're looking at the walk-in and we're looking at page three or four right mm -hmm. right and we're looking at number two or number one well, mm -hmm. And it's in parentheses says fall semester only. That's right. what that's what mm -hmm. we're talking about, right? Mm -hmm. Right. We're saying we should begin implementing that with new students, in, in, because it would be changing the game mid stride so on current students. So okay. you're proposing to modify this policy, say effective with incoming freshmen. Yeah. Blast, I mean, we're, blah, we're, blah, blah. we're all saying the same thing here. We recognize the importance, and we need to eliminate the advantage. Okay. And to Laura's point, wouldn't number three yeah, number have, four. catch this? Yeah. Issue? Yeah, number well, four says enrollment in academic classes that are required for graduation from high school, provided that failure to take such classes will result in the student being unable to graduate. Number three, three is what? Three is probably three more, is more specific right. with, in the circumstances they're talking. So if you did have somebody who needed a special situation, the administration would have that ability to do that it would, it would be tied to a specific in school right right I, I, so I just think you know when you sit down as an incoming freshman you sit down with your counselor and you lay out these four years of what you're going to do um, I think trying to cancel water polo affected 20 families and we got a lot of blowback right. there you're now going to try to affect 600 students minimum mm -hmm. and I think when you sit down, as I've done in the past, and you lay out the four years of what you're going to try to accomplish, so all of a sudden then say, well, we've got to take away uh, a class here or a semester there, that I think that's, that's not fair to when they came in, what they were expecting from going through here. Or the other way of responding to Gary's or Laura's, it's, it's only two courses for the current sophomores, freshmen, one course for the current it sophomore, may, right? It may be only two courses to you, but it could be something to get some. I'm okay, saying look. in a supportive way that if we let go with what's being recommended look. now, it has the other yeah, side of it. It's only affecting a right. handful of courses. Yeah. Right. You guys need to let someone else talk, you two, because I agree with you. You okay. haven't let me talk. Sorry, John. All right. Who, me? No. No, okay. I'm talking about Laura and Tim. Tim I mean, the floor. there's no reason to perpetuate a mistake. That's the principle I see here. This is a mistake. It's an unfair advantage to people. And it's sort of like the IRS. OK, we discover a mistake. What do you do? allow two or three years for people to take advantage of that mistake? I mean, I, I really disagree with that philosophy. I can see your point, the administration's point. But I mean, I'm in total agreement that people belong at PE. This is a, it's a loophole. And it was a mistake from a prior board to let it go through. I think we're, we're in a bind. If we as a board want to change stuff, I think we need to make it effective sooner than later. You can't perpetuate bad, bad mistakes for the reason of planning, even though that's a legitimate concern. So I think whatever the vote hit we have on this is the vote we have. Okay. Um, any other discussion? Well, I would just like to say that this board has worked very hard to save all those um, opportunities for physicals for the sports so it has been um, an emphasis to have more opportunities for physical activity okay so why don't we do this uh with the motions that we have in front of us why don't we keep that separate and vote that separate but we have to make the motion to say yeah. whether it's a waiver just for next year or whether it's a waiver for all current students so let's take it in. Take it, make a motion as to what's submitted by administration. Okay. And if it gets voted down, and it happens from that also. All right, so. so what, I have a, a different question, not about the gym, but because this was such a large policy. Um, no, it changed pages. It was 63110. It's under, it's college dual credit. Mm -hmm. I just have a question there. Uh, it was 4.5. So if a student takes a course at a college, it, it, the last point said the grade earned will be computed in the student's grade point average. Mm -hmm. Will that college grade be then averaged into their GPA? 
their high school GPA? A dual credit right. means they get one yeah. grade, and that grade is then for their transcript for college as well as their high school. So yes, if they got a B, they would count as a B on their high school GPA. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. All right, so let's uh, do we have a motion on let's do six, uh, let's do eight eight and eight ninety right now. Uh, we didn't discuss them. Well, is there any other discussion on eight eight or eight ninety? Well, it, are those the other two policies? Yes. yes. Okay. So eight eighty gifts and parents. Eight eighty. You see the changes that were made on there. Any donation in excess of. 10,000 needs board approval. We struck that and just said any donation excess of 10,000. So it's basically a repeat because the track version tracked track the same thing. So we tied that in there. Um, and then the board's legal obligations to comply with Title IX by providing equal athletic opportunity for members of both genders will supersede any organization or club's recommendation for the gift or donation. So basically, when you get to 890, what we wanted to do was refer everybody, it's cross reference with 880. So that would be the one policy you have to follow, whether we receive something from a foundation, a parents club, patrons club, booster club. Um, it would talk that they need to align with the rules and the policies of 880. The reason we use $10,000 is because uh, currently in 460, our policy is any purchase, uh, unique purchase over $10,000 uh, needs board approval, just to more or less keep the board in, in the loop of that. And we figured that'd be the same thing with uh, the, the any kind of donation we would receive this way just from only being an outsider and then being here for the last nine months seeing how there was questions regarding donations for scoreboards and things in the past this way we would be able to have in our minutes that we received a large donation from a specific organization to be used towards a specific project it would be made clear to them that we have the discretion on how we're going to apply it in the process of that project or, or, or that event and then we will also make sure that it's accounted for by our business office and it's tagged and stuff for the capital audit and those types of things. Well, assuming that we accepted um, a generous gift from an alum for, a, say, a football program, it would violate the Title IX uh, as a, an extraordinary rule that would counter a targeted gift, correct? You know, Not necessarily. Now, I, I, what I think a, probably a better example of that would be, I've been in previous district where the Fathers Club built a press box for the baseball field, and there was no Fathers Club for the softball team, and uh, the district was cited for a Title IX infraction, and they had to pay out of their fund balance a, a similar, if not better, press box for the softball field so that it was in line. So that's where I think... Uh, by 880, it, it makes clear. So, uh, if, you know, I don't want to get into the pay, but we would just say, like, if, if someone approached the boosters and they were going to give something for uniforms for the boys' soccer club, we got to make sure that we're getting new uniforms yeah. or there's a plan in place to get new uniforms for the girls' soccer club. Right. Soccer Discretionary team, I say. Thing. Right. Yeah. I think they understand. All right. Any questions on 880? Hmm. I have one. Okay. On the last sentence, said the superintendent shall develop procedures for review and approval of donations that involve incorporating messages into or placing messages upon the school property. I was just wondering, would we not also want to, you know, include procedure for review and approval of donations that don't necessarily have a message? I mean, wouldn't that procedures include whether they have a message or not. Well, I think that's that says anything over any kind of donation over ten thousand. We need to have the board approval, whether it's got a name on it or not. Yeah, I kind of read that that like you would have some kind of procedure to bring it to the board if it's ten thousand dollars. Is this separate then? This last paragraph. This is. That's the only specific an above, instance. <coughs> if, if a donee. Uh, wants to uh, incorporate a message into or place a message upon say, say that the boosters and mm -hmm. qualified their gift for the sign and say we'll only put it on there if you'll say donated by the boosters mm -hmm. okay. or you know whatever Mike or Welch Mr. makes a donation to the swimming pool and says he wants yeah. it to be called Welch <laughs> fam, you know swim pool then he'd have to do it but we don't 
have to if okay. they're donating for uniforms, we don't need to have a more specific procedure. Okay. All right. All right. Any other questions on eight eighty? Let's go to eight ninety. Any questions on eight ninety? I had some additions or ad items to to consider. Okay. Um, with the first correction, it says the organization or club has on file with the district a copy of their 501c3 status letter. I think we should also uh, include their application form 1023 with with any letters, because it could be that they uh, get a preliminary letter, and five years later they get a letter that says they're recognized as a 501c3. So. An application form 1023 in their letters and then a copy of their bylaws I agree with that and then um, if you look at the form 990 that one of the um, visitors comments talked about that I also brought up the last time we, we talked about this you know they should the bylaw should clearly state their record retention policy they should also have a conflict of interest policy so should we have that explicit in this? I think we should list that those out yeah. and, and list that the, that the, that the bylaws should list how documents are made available to the public. Mm -hmm. And then I would like to know if um, there's some way we can um, disseminate, have them disseminate to us some of their financial information. You know, I, I, are you done? Um, and then I had a couple other notes here, um, and I don't know if it went under the other one, but, you know, when they earmark money, does this policy resolve the discussion we had last time where did we strike that out, or how did we, how does that go into the thing now where, you know, I think somewhere I remember we talked about that they couldn't earmark the money for a certain purpose. They could. We struck it out so that they could make a recommendation, but it, under 880, it, it, it conflicted with the 880 and 890 conflicted in that language. Right, so that's why we struck it out of there and have everything we refer to, any kind of gifts or donations would follow policy 880. And there's number three says an agreement here by all board policies and administrative procedures, so they would have to follow 880 to make a donation. So if they're going to donate five thousand dollars for something can they earmark that or not I, I'm not sure I'm getting my question answered no they could they could make a recommendation to the they would file a policy 880 well what happens if a gift is not to the district what would you mean isn't there an organization current organization currently now that gives direct <coughs> direct gifts to students, students gives right. direct gifts to teachers right. without the district involved right. so is there a potential conflict there um, Secondly, what I had suggested last meeting was the onus, uh, I don't want to have, a, I don't, would not want this administration to have the onus to do work on behalf of, the, of, of these organizations, but can we make it clearly stated that by August 1st or August 15th of every year, they're to hand in and we have a checklist procedure, current by, uh, you know, annual report, um, list of officers, blah 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 blah, that we we the board want to have, and they ha they have to get it in by a, a certain time frame. Yeah, I think that would fall more under administrative procedure than the policy. But if you think about, well, we're putting in there right on file, just on file. file no, you one thing I think people should understand. We did this. We tried to address most of what people said. My personal opinion is we're spending more time worrying about managing. Some people have done a lot of good for these schools, then we talk about some of the big issues here. But we, we did three things. We included that they have to be a 501c3. We included the paragraph at the bottom on the walk-in on one of two that says, here's what you have to do in essence to maintain it, which would be, doesn't say when, because I don't know if they ought to file all their things at the same time. They wouldn't, with the state, it would depend upon when they initially filed that they provide their annual filings that they have to give to the federal and state government, which seems like if it's good enough for them, it should be enough. And then the last part, the last paragraph on the carryover page on 202 addresses what they would have to do that, you know, there's circumstances where we could rescind the use of our names or law logos. 
So the copy of the annual financials, Mike, isn't that in part of what they have to report on an annual basis to the state of Fed? In, in generic format, perhaps. <coughs> And, and when, we, when we talk about on file with us, I wouldn't be opposed to having them or having us say, well, if it's on their website available, then that's, that's good enough as if we can, it's been given to us. That's why we said make available. Well, the law says they have to make it available anyway. I think they should just, you know, I, I agree they should give it into us because they're using our name. But any, any of these things they should have available to the public instead of us getting it, posting it on our website where we're doing more work, we could come to some agreement where if they're posting it on their website, that would, that would satisfy whatever we would want from them. Does it make available satisfy them? Okay. We're requiring to make it available to us. It says has on file with the district a copy of the 501c3 status letter. For the again, the beginning paragraph is how they have to get started. They have to get to, for a new organization, or if they haven't done it, they have to give us the 501c3. Okay. okay so okay, that can one. they can they give us the 10 the application the 1023? You know, we can, again, if depend upon how deep we want to manage it, we could put all kinds of list of other requirements here but well, the question before you get the letter you got to put in the application so, okay. so the application has lots of detail and the application is available to the public so are you worried that that is that actually would help expedite someone that came forward and said I, I have my application in but I haven't received my letter but I'd like to start working with the school right, is that a, well it, it it expedites me asking for it if I wanted to see it you know, if you're talking about, you know, being disclosing what they're all about, that application has certain information on it to say what they're supposed to be doing or what they're what they were formed under, and then the the letter that comes shortly after that, and then the letter that comes years after that to say you know you're good to go in the future. That's kind of how they start up. And then as far as the policy, you know, the, the, the filings ask them, what is your record retention policy? If you're a 501c3, yes, what's your record retention policy? So they should already have that, so they might as well have it in their bylaws. But I, you know, I know it's, should, are, we, are we mandating what's in their bylaws? Well, on some of these things we are. And, you know, I don't even think we have a copy of all three of these organizations' bylaws. Is that true? I have uh, two of the three. Okay. One being uh, we received email that they're working in the process of updating them. Okay. Well, we should be entitled to see that bylaw as it stands now. For a vote. So I had record retention, conflict of interest, and how documents are made available to the public. And then. I know we have in here uh, yearly financial filings, but are we interested in any more detail than that? Or is it something we leave to the public to ask them about? Well, I, I'd suggest, Matt, let's say, you know, we, you helped, we drafted this. We were trying to incorporate what we thought was important, like we do with things that go to councils. Again, I don't know how much management we want to do of organizations that have filings with the state, filings with the federal government. Um, well, the boosters were formed in, 50, in 1954, and they didn't file till recently. Yep, and they've the, done and it. And the other one didn't file well, accurately. <laughs> and the other one's in the process of filling out their application, I suppose. The, the, the one area I have a concern on, and maybe is, since the policy committee just talked about this, is we have one organization who can give that we're going to allow the name on, but they have the right, they historically have given gifts directly to individuals. Is there, have you guys thought that through in your policy meeting, if there's any potential conflicts with our gift policy? You did not talk about that. My question is, maybe this is my ignorance, is that if they're an independent 501c3, they'll have to do the proper paperwork and reporting on that. 
are we do we need to get into managing managing how they use or spend their money I mean you know I think the whole key thing on this on these outside groups are one they're using our name Riverside Brookfield and if you go out to the public and say the Riverside Educational Foundation is that part of RB or not they're gonna say John Q public is gonna say yeah that's part of RB and I think that when they put that name on there, it requires them definitely uh, to go above <coughs> beyond a, a 501c3 to make sure that there's transparency. There's no question at all what's going what, uh, of any, you know, with that transparency becomes a credibility that is allowed to happen. If we need to detail more what we're asking for, and for a 501c3 that wants to be transparent and likes to be transparent, those should be easy to do because all they're doing is turning documents over that they already had before. Or even like Mike said, they've got to put it on their website. They would have to do that. My key thing right now is that we asked for bylaws for the three organizations that came here. Two we got right away. One is now in the process of updating. We need to be able to have all this information because right now it makes you wonder. And one of the major reasons I think we did this, one is to make sure that we are with these outside organizations, parent organization, Booth Club, are making sure that they are in line and transparent and are following the law to the fullest. Well, I, you know what I mean? I, I question whether any public board like ours has a duty to find out if anybody is following a federal law or a state law. That's what that government's for. And, you know, I work in a regulated industry. People put in regulations all the time, you know. This, you know, if they're meeting the requirements there, they've been doing this for years. Some people think they should do more or whatever. They do some good things. The fact is, if we pass this uh, policy the way it is and they don't provide us the bylaws that meet the requirements, we would have to suspend their use of our name. That's what it says. So we can adopt it have general rules like we do with almost every other policy here and have s superintendent procedures to address it and we can move on or we can spend more time on how we should manage people who are doing good things for the school than we've done on some pretty serious topics here and to what avail and that's one board member's opinion yes. and other board members have come up and stated something different so can I, I I'm comfortable with you know this this checklist and, and and wording there where I'm uncomfortable is what happens if if tomorrow another 501c organization comes wants to put an RV uh, associated with it with the purpose of saying I'm gonna give gifts to not to the district but to be, ben, uh, benefit uh, participants in the school and but not through the district you've allowed it for one and, and that's all in my conflict that's the only conflict that and and that's that's my you know I don't you know I don't give us a monopoly you can you enlighten us or maybe well I mean we, we, we made a point to, come, to the district. we made a point to talk about gifts to the district right but if okay. it's not a specific gift to the district let's say we only could fund uh, three teachers to attend a national conference and an organization wanted to fund or we can only fund uh, a couple of athletic individuals so but there's another organization out there would be more than willing to fund a particular coach to go and do something that's you know I, I'm just throwing these you can throw hypotheticals all what over the place stop them? yeah the I use mean, of the name I don't know. I, I, I don't know. You could have the uh, RB patrons, RB boosters. Yeah. You could have the, the RB good guys. That's all. I'm, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. The previous district I was in. do good stuff. The yeah, I know. The district, the district had multiple schools, so they only funded a specific amount of coaches for specific sports. Uh, sports. If any other high in any other school wanted an additional coach above and beyond what the district allotted and, and supported through their tax supported funds uh, the outside group let's say a booster club could fund the stipend of that coach the only thing that was in place was that uh, the money had to circulate through the district 
uh, the school district's treasurer's office so that the proper taxes were taken out, like so they were in compliance with state and federal law. But they allowed them to fund an additional. So state is that going to weigh title? Does it skirt the title issue? Title stop. No, title nine. I mean, title nine. Sure. Still follow the title nine. Yeah. Well, I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to because you can <laughs> fund that and you didn't have to fund. But if, a co if, we, if we were going to say we were going to have one basketball court, and that, let's, use this, let's take Title IX out of it. I mean, we would have to, we would make sure that the district funded those equally. All right, any other questions? On Just, uh, yeah, no. I, I have a comment on one, one easy question. I think we had talked in the past about insurance. Did we have to, are they supposed to have their own insurance or? not and then um, second comment if they're their own 501 C they have their own structure of governance and the members are supposed to monitor that they're being I would think it's their own members and their own board that should be monitoring that they are following those laws so I would hope that our policy is not restrictive to allow it to function as it's intended. And I can think of one example, I think of a private school, um, especially like, like Mother Macaulay, a wonderful school. Uh, the women get together and they, um, they want to see other young women succeed in math and sciences. So they have this big fundraiser and they raise money for college scholarships. So that could happen here. You know, we could have some women who have graduated. They could have the RB Women's Alumni Group, and they could have this little fundraiser and give scholarships to our young women to maybe go into some career. You know, I mean, that could happen. And if they're their own 501c3, they would have their own governance, their own structure. I mean, are we uh, Making it too restrictive so those kind of things can't blossom and grow and happen. I'm talking about disclosure type issues rather than. But they would have their own structure <coughs> governance under to be a 501c3. They they have rules that they have to abide by, don't they? Yeah. What's the question? I, I don't yes. understand the question. <laughs> Yes. The well, they have, but by being incorporated, they already have a governance. They have their own board, and they have members that are monitoring them. I don't understand why we would monitor them. I think part of the purpose of the policy law is to make sure that they have some specific things in their bylaws and their governance set up, so that we feel that. The, the use of our name uh, tied to that association. That, that's the only way I could interpret it. But might we be requiring too much? Here, this is general enough to allow other things to flourish. But if we start to ask for their financials and that. But they're required under 501c3 to provide. To not give it to stuff. us, to give it to their members. But they can provide it as, as a filing for that organization. It has to be a public that's disclosure. Yeah, right. It's in there. We ask for status and financial information. Yeah, right. we, it's, that's a public, in there. it's a public document. Yeah. Yeah. What? Yeah. Whatever they report to the state or Fed is. is, is uh, okay. We'll Any other questions on 890? Well, it seems there's. Uh, there's some issues with this. Uh, I guess my question to Mike, I mean, do you want to offer an alternative if this thing doesn't pass? I mean, one thing that I want to see put in there, Gary made a reference to, uh, the, it says permission to use one of the above mentioned names or logos will continue as long as on an annual basis. We should say what day or whatever, September 1st of what year it's provided. So I think we talked about this before. So there should be a day that they have to year. like, John. Beginning of school year. Or? The, the problem with there's twofold with doing that. One is we got 50 different policies that say the superintendent makes the rules. The second one is I'm not positive, but the IRS, their federal filings are all doing the same date. But I think the state filing depends upon when they initially filed. They're not due at the same time every year, so it would depend upon when they had to file when the next filing is due. The one that was referred to that 
again, the Secretary of State puts what they want on the website. And believe me, we have a lot of companies and they make a lot of mistakes. But that filing is dependent on when you initially incorporated. It's, it could be you know, January 1st, June 1st, September 1st. So that's why we said, again, like, like most of our policies do is, you know, they have to do it and they'll have to, the superintendent will make sure they do it and it will depend probably what time of the year that is. But we could have something there that says we're going to discuss this in September. One of the organizations is a calendar yeah, I mean, year. We need, to, we need to have this on the agenda every year to make sure that they're in compliance and I want to report from the superintendent to say that they are. That, that's, that's my point here for the timing. But we don't put that in other policies. Well, well there's nothing, what's wrong with putting it in this one? I mean, I don't think it hurts anything. It just makes sure that a lot of stuff in this policy, these policies have been ignored in the past and I think it's obvious some people in the community have an issue with this and I think we need to address that concern. And that's can one we way just, I think we could. Can we just, and, and, and maybe since we have the annual basis and we have this uh, district operational calendar now, yeah. is that we would just sure. earmark that, hey, every October we're going to report out, yeah. provide yeah. to the board the three copies of the bylaws and the, or you know, we'll just to make sure that it's done. Right. Because four years from now, we may have a new board and we may forget. One, one of the organizations, well, Jen, right. one of the organizations is a calendar year. And one of the organizations ends June 30th, like we do. So putting a specific date on it isn't going gonna, isn't gonna to really be helpful. I know that the Illinois Association of School Boards sets as a model to review your policies, kind of like a clock. And they say as you start to develop, um, in the months, there's 12 months, just like a clock, you know, you're going to go through, this is, you know, eight, you know, the different sections of your policy book on those different months. And they say, just get in that routine and you can be reviewing them. So that might be a way to, and that would just be like a procedure for us to be able to review and make sure it's the same. Okay, so what's our, our pleasure on 890? Say we make the motion that we originally had, let people vote on it. Okay, so we're going to take each one of these separate then. Okay. So let's start with the easiest one, policy 880. We have a motion on policy 880. Resolve that the Board of Education Township High School District 2A, Cook County, Illinois, hereby, excuse me, Illinois, hereby adopts policy 880 gifts to the district as presented in the walk-in agenda I was that one changed that one wasn't changed was no. it? Let's okay it's one. presented in the May 8 2012 board agenda packet Do I have a second 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 by Gary Gritchen any other for discussion Marianne Dr. King yes Mr. Moon yes Mr. Walsh yes Mr. Welch yes Mr. Gritchen yes Ms. Ruska yes Mr. Cindy yes all right let's go to policy 6310 Okay, yes. resolve. I'll, I'll put the language in okay. to address that. Resolve that the Board of Education Township High School District 208, Cook County, Illinois, here adopts, hereby adopts policy 6310, credit for alternative courses and programs and course substitution, and suspends the application of, with respect to uh, the band waiver for only the uh, fall period for all current. RB students as presented in the amended um, walk-in resolution provided to the board at the May 8th, 2012 meeting. Do I have a second? Second. I'll second it. Seconded by uh, Laura. So what does that mean? <laughs> so <laughs> what are we voting on? So, <laughs> the, 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 so this, this grants the waiver. For any yes. current students while the current students would be able to wave out of uh, gym for the whole year yeah. until they graduate. But the freshmen coming in 2013 and 14 would go underneath. Yes. Okay. And, that, and that's what they're recommending? That's what you're recommending, recommending, right, Kevin? Yeah. All right, any other discussion? Mary Ann? So oh, I on. just want to be clear. So that means uh, we're not going to allow this whole year waiver. We have, uh, we have fresh, freshmen walking through the door in August. When they became juniors, they would not be able to wave out of a year. 
but unless we they haven't won't started make, their four-year plan. It's, it's, it's broader than that. They also won't be able to take uh, fine arts or what health in the summer and wave out of it sophomore year. So there, there'd just be no waivers in the second semester anymore. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you want to finish your question, Laura? Yeah. So that means we're not starting this rule blanket in 2013. Anybody who is currently now can continue with this right. rule. Right. That's what the administration has recommended. Right. Okay. I, would, I would say we made clear. What What is the freshman class that is coming in in August? 2015. Class, class of 2016. 2016, is it? I think they would probably be the easiest way to say effective yeah, with the class, the class of 2016. Because then when they become, it's effective basically. I'd like to win. I would. It's the class, they're coming in in the fall of 2012. Right. So 13, 14, 14 15, mm -hmm. 16, 17. The class oh. of 2017. So 2017. Wow. So that this I'll would start with the class of 2017. All right. We got a motion someone out there. would say, well, technically yeah. they picked their classes. They come in this fall. 13, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, too, too specific, Tim. Okay, <laughs> class of 20. Well, I'm telling you the difference in what you said yeah, and I that's said. Right. Okay. All right, for the class, beginning with the class of 2016. 16. And Laura, do yeah. you accept the yes. change? All right, Marianne? Mr. Moon? Yes. Mr. Walsh? Yes. Mr. Welch? Yes. Mr. Gritchen? Yes. Ms. Ruska? Yes. Dr. King? No. Mr. Cindy? Yes. Okay. No. Resolved that the Board of Education Township High School District 2A Cook County, Illinois hereby adopts uh, policy 890, parent organization and boosters clubs. Was that one amended in today's package? Yes. yes. As amended and presented to the board at the May 8th, 2012 meeting. Second. Second by Dan Moon. Any other discussion? Without the application, all letters, record retention, conflict of interest, how documents are made available to the public. You want to amend it? No. Okay. And so none of those are included in what we're voting for? No, it's for. we're voting on what was presented. To no, me. but okay. it could be in the bylaws. If, I, if it I, became I, attached to it. Just want to be clear how the resolution is. No, you're right. All right. So any other us. discussion on this? All right, Marianne? Mr. Walsh? Yes. Mr. Welch? No. Mr. Gritchen? Yes. Ms. Ruska? Yes. Dr. King? No. Mr. Moon? No. Mr. Cindy? No. Okay. Do you want to put another motion up that would have all the uh, information that Mike added to the amendment? Uh, we've waited this long. You want to just push it to the next meeting? I think we got to probably. You got to uh, redraft. I think redraft some things yeah, redraft and bring it to the June action meeting. Uh, yes. So okay, just we'll for that. just as the board okay with Mr. Welch summarizing some things he'd like to see. Send it to the policy. Yeah. So can you just send an email to me to address at the advisory? And can I ask you, anybody else has anything to add? Send it to Kevin. Uh, so the only thing I'd like to tell you is by not making the changes, you're not getting some of the things you already want now. So we'll wait at least a month to get some of the things you wanted and may or may not get that. Okay. So 890 will be held and will we have enough for the, when are we going to have a policy meeting? Not till, not till after the, after the comp. All right. So that will come back so to So we won't talk okay. about 890 till June 2nd. All right. June. Let's okay. move to, you know, the people from Gallagher, you don't need to be here. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you are. We're going to get to them.